<laughs> if you've ever played a Pikmin game, you know that scouring the planet PNF404 for resources takes you through a variety of environments and challenges. Throughout the series, the player and their platoon of plant creatures must build bridges, tear down walls, defeat monsters, and brave the elements to obtain whatever prize happens to be their target at the moment. If you've ever played a Pikmin game, you probably also know that the music perfectly captures the moment-to-moment -moment action of the game regardless of what you choose to do at any given time. This is because each game in the series has a dynamic soundtrack. For the unaware, a dynamic soundtrack in a game is one where the music changes in some way in reaction to what's happening on screen. This technical definition is pretty broad, encompassing everything from the abrupt change in music when you get a star in Super Mario Bros to dropped notes in a rock band game, but colloquially the term is used a little more specifically. In Pikmin, and games with similar dynamic soundtracks, each tune on the soundtrack has multiple versions running under the hood simultaneously, with the situation in the game dictating which version or versions bubble up above the surface at any given time. This can be super useful in open world games where the player is in complete control of what they do and how long they do it for. So let's look at a few of the ways that the Pikmin games use this technique to effectively score the action. <laughs> In all three of the Pikmin games, the player's exploration is separated into days, with each day having a time limit that the player has to work within to do whatever they want to do. Towards the end of each day, the sun begins to set, which serves as a warning to wrap it up and get back to home base. As the day winds down, so does the music, with the theme of whatever level you're exploring fading out as the sunset version of the same theme fades in. These sunset versions feature a more subdued orchestration to bring the energy down in preparation for the end of the day. Here, I'll show you what I mean. In the first Pikmin game's first level, the impact site where your spaceship crashed on a strange planet, the music is an interesting mixture of lighthearted and jarring. The childlike melody is given primarily to glockenspiel and pizzicato strings, with oboe, string sectioned and contrabassoon complementing with punches of chromaticism. The high and playful melody suggests your newly discovered Pikmin pals, while the jagged lines and sudden chromatic movement add an element of uncertainty that you would expect from your first foray into the wilderness of a foreign planet. But as the sun goes down, this orchestration fades out for something a little more serene. The melody is now covered by a recorder, which retains the childlike quality of the glockenspiel and pizzicato strings, but with a little bit of a softer tone. Every other instrument providing the accompaniment, save for the oboe, is disposed of, in favor of a new finger-picked classical guitar part. Cutting the size of the ensemble in half, choosing instruments that have nice soft tones, and leaving more space in the arrangement all contribute to winding down the action and getting the player ready to pack it in for the day. When the game calls for something less serene, such as when dealing with the various hostile creatures you find around planet PNF404, we see the music shift appropriately. In Pikmin 2's perplexing pool stage, the music changes as you draw close to an enemy, adding in this driving xylophone part that uses the interval of a major second to add a sense of urgency. The xylophone gives off kind of a breaking news vibe, but I think it works well as a warning signal to the player. If you fail to heed that signal and find yourself in a fight with a baddie, the xylophone is joined by an entire percussion section. We'll talk about this more later, but going from the bass level music, which has no percussion instruments, to a full percussion section is a great way to raise the stakes musically going into a battle. 
Now, the first Pikmin game's music changed when you either engaged an enemy or when the day got close to sunset, but the sequels take this idea a bit further by introducing dynamic musical changes when your Pikmin perform a task, such as building a bridge or breaking through an obstacle, as well as when they carry something valuable back to your ship. Pikmin 3's Garden of Hope theme is a beautiful atmospheric tune that uses woodwinds and acoustic guitar to evoke the peaceful side of nature. It's very rhythmically unobtrusive. There's pretty much only ever one instrument propelling the music forward at once, while the other instruments fade in and out with a more ornamental role. When the flutes come in with this 8th note melody, the guitar switches from an 8th note arpeggiated figure to held chords and vice versa. so pretty. This all changes once you start putting your Pikmin to work. When you send the little guys to build a bridge or break down a barrier, hand drums, shaker, and a bass part fade into the music. Beyond the low-hanging fruit of making the music busier as your Pikmin become busier, I think these additions actually capture the spirit of this aspect of the game really well. The hand drums specifically add this kind of earthy quality that fits the Pikmin's communal labor. It kinda reminds me of the same way drums are used on a galley to keep the rowers in sync. Anyways, as you can see, there are a lot of reasons why a composer would want to change a game's music dynamically to fit whatever action the player is involved in. Going for this kind of soundtrack presents a composer with certain extra challenges, which can actually lead to some really interesting writing. You've probably noticed that the bass version of every tune we've looked at so far is very open and ambient, and that's no accident. One of the principles of arranging any kind of music is to leave space in your arrangement for the music to grow as it goes along. With a dynamic soundtrack, you have to leave space in your music for all of the extra elements that could be added depending on the player's actions. Let's take a look at what I think of as the three most fundamental ways to leave space in an arrangement. The first and most obvious method would be to use rhythmic space, or the literal space in between the notes of your piece. The original game's distant spring music is one of the most ambient tracks in the series, with different synths layering on top of each other with no easily discernible beat or rhythm underneath. These different colors of synths slide in and out of focus, layering together to create some interesting harmonies and a very distinct mood for exploring the level at hand. The thick tones of the different synths, as well as the colorful harmonies created, keep the music from feeling sparse or empty even though there's so much space in between each note. This creates a perfect opportunity for contrast when the player engages with an enemy. The dreamy mood is shattered by the strings and bass drum pounding away in this trudgingly slow oompa rhythm. I love the way that this part completely changes the context of the same synth lines that play throughout the main version. It's almost unrecognizable. Another important way to leave space in an arrangement is by paying attention to each instrument's range. In Pikmin 2's first area, the Valley of Repose, the music consists of a harmonized melody in the handbells played way up high and a stately bass line in the cellos. And uh, of course some sleigh bells because there's snow on the ground, so... This leaves a range of about a ninth between the highest bass note and the lowest melody note, with the average range between the two being more like two and a half octaves. This means that when your squad of Pikmin start carrying treasure back to your ship, the tremolo mandolin melody and bouncy marimba accompaniment that join the music can slot right into the space without cluttering up the music at all. This is 
also another example of filling in rhythmic space as the heavy quarter note pulse in the original version gets filled in by the accented 16th note upbeats of the marimba part. The final and potentially the most difficult way to keep an arrangement open is by leaving harmonic space. By this I mean that all the elements that you add to a piece of music should have something meaningful to add, so if the original version of a tune keeps things harmonically ambiguous, it creates great opportunities for additional musical elements to really contribute to the piece in a meaningful way. Let's go back to Perplexing Pool, which is a great example of this idea. Check out these eight bars. The first four bars are a little vague, but not totally impenetrable. The guitar part outlines a G-flat sus2 chord moving to an A-flat7 chord without the third, and the melody reinforces this analysis by walking clearly from the root to the fifth of a G-flat chord before sitting on the third of the A-flat chord that was missing from the accompaniment. So far, it seems that we're swirling around in G-flat Lydian. The next four bars are a little more confusing, an emphasis on a G natural in the melody below the F G natural D flat pattern in the accompaniment imply a G half diminished chord, putting us in the G locrian mode. Before you can say locrian though, our accompaniment moves this D flat up to a D natural, making this a G minor 7 chord. This is potentially the weirdest chord progression I've ever heard. It's like every bar pulls the rug out from under your feet over and over, making the level's name seem more and more appropriate. Looking at the working version of the tune that plays when your Pikmin are overcoming some obstacle in the level sheds some light on the harmony by laying down a solid bass part underneath all of this madness. With the bass, it becomes clear that this is a colorful variation on the hyper-common 4-5-1-6 move. Starting from this basic structure, the composer, Hajime Wakai, found interesting colors to add to each chord and then pulled the foundation out from the harmony for the basic level music. The willingness to leave things deliberately unclear allowed the working version of this piece to add something truly valuable to the mix. It's so exciting to see all of the new ways that video games allow people to write and experience music, and the impetus on player freedom and control opens up a lot of cool new musical opportunities to explore. Big thanks to patrons KJ Gisherton for the suggestion, and Thomas Esker for seconding the suggestion. If you'd like, you can follow me on Twitter at 8BitMusicTheory, and if you'd like to support this channel, you can check out my Patreon page here. Also, I'd like to take this opportunity to plug the official 8-Bit Music Theory Discord. We already have a great community of some really cool people hanging out there, so I'd invite you all to check it out if that sort of thing interests you. I'll put a link in the description below, right next to the subscribe and like buttons. Right next to the subscribe and like buttons. Uh, <laughs> anyways, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. <laughs>